Thank you for joining us for a conversation with Vaughn Shepard, part of a series of webinars on building a profession sponsored by the Education Trust and the Wallace Foundation. Now I'm pleased to turn the call over to the first speaker today, Karen Chenoweth, writer in residence at the Education Trust. Karen, please go ahead. Thank you. Common sense tells us and extensive research confirms that school principals are important. If we want all students to achieve, it's quite clear that we need principals who not only believe in the capabilities of students, but have ways of harnessing all the skill and knowledge of all the adults in the building to help students achieve. But this is a relatively new demand on principals. For the most part, principals have been thought of as building managers, not instructional leaders. In previous webinars, we have explored what it means for principals to put instruction at the center of their jobs. Today, and in subsequent webinars in this series, we will be discussing how districts and states can help principals make that transition from building leader to instructional leader. We will be talking with some proven school leaders who are now in new roles in the district and state levels supporting principals. But first, let me introduce myself. I am Karen Chenoweth, co-author of Getting It Done, Leading Academic Success in Unexpected Schools. Here today is my co-author, Christina Theokas, who is Director of Research at the Education Trust, a national education advocacy organization that works to improve academic achievement for all children, but particularly children of color and children who live in poverty. Hello, Christina. Hi, Karen. It's great to be back for this series of webinars that build on our prior discussions of exemplary leadership. Today we're going to be talking with Vaughn Shepard, who from 2001 to 2005 led Dayton's Bluff Achievement Plus Elementary School in St. Paul, Minnesota, and is currently an assistant superintendent in Boulder, Colorado, supervising the elementary schools. Uh, this conversation is going to be a little far-ranging because we want to talk with Vaughn about his rather dramatic turnaround experience at Dayton's Bluff, but also how that experience informs his current work and how that work fits in with what we know more generally about school leadership. Um, Vaughn, this is Karen. You and I Thank met you. back in 2005 when I visited Dayton's Bluff, and I subsequently wrote about it in my first book, It's Being Done. And for listeners who are interested, I've put a link um, somewhere uh, to, uh, to the book uh, if they're interested in reading more about Dayton's Bluff. And here's a picture I took of you uh, during that visit, squeezing into an elementary school desk, observing instruction. <laughs> I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about your experiences as a school leader. What kind of training, let's start right at the very beginning. What kind of training and experience did you have before you walked into Dayton's Bluff? Well, you know, after my football career, you know, I still had a burning desire to compete, and I knew I needed a challenge, uh, but I knew, also knew that I needed to transfer the abilities I had playing football to being a leader off the field. And so, oh, as an assistant, so I'm going to interrupt you and kind of brag on you for a little bit. You were you were one of the most highly recruited football players out of Minnesota and played wing back for the University of Nebraska for any college football fans out there. And you signed with the Minnesota Vikings, is that right? Yeah, I signed with the Minnesota Vikings. You know, I had some injuries and then I played overseas for a couple of years, but you know, that training on the football field really helped me transfer those abilities to to being a leader off the field. And uh, when I was an assistant principal for three years, uh, you know, I felt I was kind of leading a career death because I hadn't had an opportunity to be an instructional leader, and the only uh, instructional preparation that I got was through the Leadership Institute for Aspiring Principals, uh, a program that all of us had to go through before we became a principal. But I really had no training at all. So, so, the, so you were an assistant principal in a high school, so that meant you dealt with discipline, I right? dealt with discipline. I dealt with discipline all day long. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but, but because you were aspiring, the district had enrolled you in the University of Pittsburgh's Aspiring Leaders program, is that right? Yes, that was after I became a principal, and, and it was run by Lauren okay. Resnick. And so uh, that was a pretty intense program as well. Uh, I was also a part of a principal's think tank, and I, I'll talk a little bit about that later. But um, I, I tell you, districts really need to invest in their principals because Pat Harvey, who was the superintendent at that time, uh, also made me her intern. 
and uh, she just did some incredible things to prepare me to be the instructional leader that I needed to be. So, so here you were. You were dying to be a principal, basically, mm-hmm. because you you felt you called it a career death as an assistant principal. I, I, I suspect there are a lot of assistant principals out there who who kind of that resonated with. Um, and so, how how did you become principal of Dayton's Bluff? Well, our superintendent, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Pat Harvey, had led a delegation of us. Uh, principals, assistant principals, board members, uh, teachers, students, uh, to visit some smaller learning communities in New York City. And I remember being in my hotel, pacing back and forth, saying, you know, Vaughn, you need a purpose. You need a challenge in your life. And for me, that challenge was having my own school. And so we visited schools in Brooklyn, uh, the Bronx, uh, District Number 2, and they were doing some incredible things in reading. They were getting some good results. Uh, but it was coming from Frederick Douglass Academy in Harlem, that uh, my superintendent sat next to me. Uh, she began to talk to me about her career, uh, her mentors. And then after about 15 minutes, she leaned over and said, Vaughn, you're a good listener. And I said, "Miss Harvey, I want your toughest school. And she said, I may have some plans for you. And um, I went through the, the summer uh, program institute. And afterwards, uh, I applied and uh, became the, the new principal at Dayton's Bluff Achievement Plus Elementary School. So I want to I want to just show the audience something about Dayton's Bluff. So Dayton's Bluff at that uh, th- these are actually kind of old slides. So I'm not sure they completely reflect current uh, demographics. But back then, back in the day when you were there, it was about half African American, about a a fifth Asian, mostly uh, young children from who were Hmong, as I as I recall. Uh, right. And then the rest, Latino, white, a, a pretty nice mixture of, uh, of students, mostly uh, students who lived in poverty, uh, 92% low income. Does that ring a bell at all? Absolutely. Absolutely. Your numbers are correct. And when you arrived, it was widely regarded as the, I mean, just to be brutally honest, the worst school in St. Paul and thus in Minnesota. Is that right? You know, it was. I was considered the worst school in the state of Minnesota, one of the worst schools in the state of Minnesota. Discipline was out of control. Students routinely disrespected teachers. And on any given day, 80% of the teachers would call in sick. And the subs that relieved them, by the end of the day, vowed never to return. There was low test scores, low teacher morale. There was negative press every other month. And by the end of the school year, the principal asked for a transfer. And so the district decided to restructure the school, and during the restructure process, all the teachers were asked to reapply for their jobs. Uh, They had to sign on the dotted line to add 10 extra days on the teacher's contract for ongoing professional development. They had to choose a a curriculum based on base practices, and they ended up choosing the Readers and Writers Workshop and Math component uh, from America's Choice. Um, And uh, I think... At the end of that time, the spring of 2001, they began to look for a turnaround principal, and that's when they decided to hire me. And after I accepted the job, there was a huge backlash in the African-American community. There were many people, leaders, uh, telling me not to take the job. They said, Vaughn, the district is trying to set you up. They're trying to set you up to fail. I said, I appreciate your concern, but I believe that I can make a difference. Well, I'm now going to show the data Um, So this next slide shows the growth in grade 5 reading, and and we're just showing grade 5, but there were improvements across the grade levels, uh, grade 3 and 5, in the data. And you can see, participants can see here that 2002 uh, was a nadir for the school. That blue line is the school's uh, proficiency rate, uh, percent, percent of students who met the standard. That yellow line is the state uh, proficiency rate. And so that you, you made considerable improvement in grade five reading. And here's the math. You were at state averages, which considering everything that you just said is quite a remarkable uh, improvement. So um, let's see. 
So can you talk about the things that went into that? So we've heard what it was like when you arrived, and we see this data. Can you just talk about the, uh, the improvement process? You know what, uh, our structures were in place, and I believe we hired the right people. Um, the district allowed me to go in a couple of weeks early, and I had an opportunity to, to hire some teachers. I called all of the summer school principals, and I asked them who their superstars were. And many of my teachers were first and second year teachers. And, you know, I, I constantly say this when I go around the country and speak. Um, you need teaching superstars in order to do this work. You know, I call them teaching superstars because that's the, the performance I expect them to, to perform at. That, that's the level I expect them to perform at. And our teachers focused on achievement. That was their target. They assessed, they collected and analyzed the data. They developed a class plan, found instructional needs, developed a strategy. They taught, retaught, and monitored. You know, but one of the things that I had to do was I had to facilitate the art of collaboration. My teachers were so tired of hearing the word collaboration, I think they ducked every time that I said it. But um, I needed them to know that, you know, this was about teamwork, you know, and collaboration. And I told them, I said, I don't need any lone wolves. I said, if you want to be a lone wolf, then you need to, to stalk elsewhere. And uh, they all came together, and I tell you, they did an incredible job, not only with our, our kids, but uh, with the parents and the community. Um, they, they rose to the occasion. You know, our leadership team, we met uh, once a week. Uh, we looked at our school's continuous improvement plan on a weekly basis. You know, everybody had a job to do once they left that meeting. You know, they needed to go out to their teams to see if we were actually doing what we said that we were going to do in our plan. And so we looked at student work. We, we problem solved. We planned for monthly expectations. We monitored progress by collecting and analyzing data. You know, when we went into a classroom, there were certain things that we expect our teachers to know and be able to do. And so um, it was just an incredible uh, uh, group effort. And you, you can't do this work without creating an environment that's conducive for learning. You know, and that meant dealing with uh, discipline, you know, from a student standpoint and a teaching one. You know, I told my teachers, you know, the first two days are going to make or break you. You must establish the rituals and routines. You know, many people ask me, you know, Ron, what was it like those first couple of months? And I tell them it was like the wild, wild west. It was like high noon those those first couple of months. Um, you know, kids were dancing on tables, uh, riding their bikes through the school and letting people in from the neighborhood, and they would loop the building. So I had to lock the doors. But I also had to set the tone with the parents. I told them discipline is a part of the education system, and I wasn't going to allow their child or any child to disrupt the learning environment in the classroom. And so I was very, very visible, not only those first couple of months, but throughout my career as a principal at Dayton's Bluff. And on any given day, the kids never knew when I'd show up. I get a call from a teacher. So, Vaughn, as... as we talk, I'm going to show a few pictures from when I was out there visiting you. But let me ask you this. Did you consider, or do, looking back, do you think you were an instructional leader when you walked in? Absolutely not. You know, one of the things that I tell people, you know, when I speak is, uh, you know, I told my staff, and, and I was a little vulnerable. Um, that I was going to learn with them, that I didn't know much about the elementary world. I come from, you know, the high school setting as an assistant uh, principal. Uh, like I said, uh, not really knowing much about instructional leadership, but I knew a lot about leadership by watching one of the greatest college football coaches of all time, Tom Osborne. I learned a lot about grit, hard work, preparation, setting sh long and sh short-term goals. But I really had no clue about instructional leadership and I told my staff that I was going to learn with them. We had a two, three-year plan for professional, ongoing professional development with the Readers and Writers Workshop, uh, the Institute for Learning out of the, the University of Pittsburgh, where we did learning walks. Donna Michelle was one of the, the, the best instructional leaders that I learned from. And so I learned from people in those programs as well as my own teachers. My teachers taught me a lot about what I know about instructional leadership today. So, Vaughn, it sounds like your uh, disciplinary skills were necessary at the beginning, but you quickly also focused on instruction, and it was a journey that you went on with your teachers. What role did the district play in helping you to become an instructional leader and supporting that development? 
you know, as I said earlier, you know, they uh, enrolled me into the Institute for Learning out of Pittsburgh, you know, a program that Lauren Resnick uh, um, ran, and, you know, they brought in the top uh, educational leaders from across the country to, to, to help us. I was a part of a principal's think tank when they uh, brought in 25 principals from across the country. We, we learned a lot about um, uh the latest issues uh, around research. We talked about the principal's evaluation and uh, what we could do to, to help researchers, uh, you know, put, put a better uh, rubric together, you know, for the principalship. And so, you know, I went through a very, very intense program to where uh, I not only learned from my teachers, but, you know, learned from people from throughout the country. And when so, I super go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, so you, you can hear us okay, Vaughn? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, great. We got a message that maybe we were disconnected. We wanted to make sure that you could hear us. So the, the district helped by putting you into this program. Um, so it sounds like they really took seriously the, the idea of developing you. In addition to the program, were there other supports the district put in place or did within the district to support your development? Absolutely. Uh, you know, my first two years, I had a mentor, and I had a mentor from the high school level, and um, Bill Dunn, I'll never forget him, a uh, very, very savvy, very, very knowledgeable principal, and, you know, this is something that we do in our district. I, I think that's one of the most valuable resources that a, a new principal can have is having that person that has already been in the system, knows the ropes, knows the, the resources to get, know who to call, you know, when, you know, that principal is struggling with something, and so, um, but also, you know, as an assistant superintendent, you know, that support from uh, that principal supervisor is it, critical, and, you know, I'll talk a little bit later, but to building those relationships, uh, the evaluation part is, is important, but building that relationship with that principal, I think, is more important, you know, so that principal can hear you when he or she needs to be coached, can hear you when you know, he or she needs to be talked to about uh, teacher evaluation or uh, RTI or, or something that, uh, or facilitation skills. You know, that's one of the things that, you know, I really work on with the principals that I work with. You know, you have well, to. This is Karen again. Let's transition to talk about your role as, um, as assistant superintendent of Boulder, Colorado. You, sur you supervise all the elementary schools uh, there. Tell us a little bit about the, the district and about the schools that you supervise. You know, the district has about 30,000 students. Uh, I supervise uh, 18, 19 schools out of about 29 uh, elementary schools in, in the district. Uh, and, um, you know, most of the schools that I supervise are high-achieving schools. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I do, particularly, you know, with our students of color, special ed students, our English language learners, uh, our students that are not doing so well, um, that are lagging behind, um, those are some of the areas that I focus on with the, with the principals that I work with. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that I talk to them about as well, and we can't forget this, we can't forget about our middle-of-the-road kids as well. You know, those kids can become invisible because they're doing okay, they're doing average. But we also have to think about our higher achieving kids, our talented and gifted kids. Many times teachers don't know how to differentiate that instruction. So my job with the, with the principals that I work with is how do you motivate and how do you inspire, you know, those teachers to, to teach at all of those levels and make sure that they have an individual learning plan for all of their kids. And so that all of their kids, not just high achieving, but growing as well. So it sounds as if you really see your role as an assistant superintendent in the kind of, you're trying to play the role for your schools that St. Paul, as a district, played for you. Is that accurate? Absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the things that I, I try and do is model what I expect the principals that I work with to know and be able to do with their teachers. When we have monthly meetings, I make sure that my principals co-facilitate, co-lead with me because it's, this work is about empowering teachers. It's about empowering principals to do their best work. And so I model it, and then my expectation is that they do it with their teachers, and they're doing an incredible job in Boulder. 
So Vaughn, you mentioned that um, the relationship with your supervisor was important, but you also had a mentor. Um, in your district, do you provide mentors to the principals as well, or are you playing both of those roles? So we provide a mentor to every new principal, that, whether they're a veteran or they're a first-year principal. You know, like I said, that's, I, I believe that that's one of the most critical things that a new principal uh, coming into our system needs, you know, that face-to-face -face contact, you know, being able to, to know. I mean, we take them through an induction program to where, um, you know, they meet with all of the people at the district office. They know where the resources are. But just having that person to talk to about certain issues, whether it be around uh, teacher evaluation, you know, we have training for that. But... It's, it's just more important, I think, to talk to a live human being rather than getting a piece of paper saying the word this is or that is and, and uh, trying to, to, to manage that way. Um, I think the, a, a live person is much more valuable, a much more valuable resource um, than, than anything that uh, we, we can do at the district office. Sure, uh, you know, I try my best to coach and to uh, to help them with, with issues, uh, whether it be parents or, or kids or, or anything that comes across their desk that they may need some help with. You know, I'm right there. And so I visit schools a lot, and, um, you know, we do check-ins. You know, as part of the evaluation system, you know, they have to show me artifacts. You know, they talk, I talk a lot about their goals at the beginning of the year. And I'm, I do check-ins to make sure they're actually doing what they said that they were going to do. And so when I visit, they have to show me artifacts that they are getting into classrooms. They have to show me artifacts that they um, are uh, making sure that they're giving a teachers meaningful feedback, not just going into the classroom and watching. You know, teachers want and expect meaningful feedback from their principals who are the instructional leaders in their building. And so I try and model that. So it sounds like... Part of when you're going out and visiting with the principals, you have certain expectations that they need to meet or standards um, that you are looking for. Has your district identified a set of principal standards that you follow, or is this something you've generated from your own experience? No, I mean, they have a set of standards that uh, when I go in, um, I fill out, uh, you know, the different standards, whether it be around communication, whether it be around uh, rapport with uh, teachers and students and parents. Uh, there are surveys that uh, the staff take, the students take, and the parents take, and, and we take that very seriously. But there are five standards that uh, principals must be able to, to, to know and be able to do. And when I go out, I take the folder with me, and, and I check. You know, when we walk around, I specifically look for certain things. And then afterwards, we talk about them. So, so what, what are those five? If there are only five, you can name them, right? <laughs> That's a simple list. Yes, there's uh, communication is one. Um, instructional leadership, effective instructional leadership is two. You know, promoting and understanding diversity. And then uh, being able to manage uh, schools' resources and the learning environment. And like I said earlier, that communication piece is, is very, very important. And so... Uh, you know, when I go into the school, these are some of the things that I look for. You know, it, it's, it's interesting. When you go into schools, you know what kind of relationships principals have with their teachers and with their students. If you go into a classroom and, and kids come up and hug that principal, or if you're in the hallway and kids come up and hug that principal, or if you're at the junior high or, or senior high level, you know, there are a certain emotional ties that kids have with the leaders in their building. And when I see that, that tells me that that principal has a connection, has an emotional tie with his or her students. You know, and that's a part of that rapport piece. You know, communication skills is critical. You know, I check out how they facilitate their meetings, how they run their meetings. Do they empower their teachers to, to co-lead with them? And if they don't, then that tells me that, you know, it could be dictatorial. You know, oh, and oftentimes and, the relationship between principals and districts is one of compliance, and it sounds uh -huh. like these standards really help articulate what principals uh, need to know and be able to do, as you said. How do you make it so they are um, sort of goals to live by versus having them just comply with you or do what you're looking for? Well, you know what? You know, there are some compliance issues that, uh, and I think every district, um, you know, principals have to know and be able to do, and 
You know, but I also allow my the principals that I work with to be creative and innovative. You know, Pat Harvey, the superintendent in, in, in St. Paul, allowed me to be creative and innovative, and that's how I believe um, we were able to take our school from one level to the next. She allowed me to be flexible, and I allow the principals that we work with to be um, flexible. Again, my job is, is, is to motivate and inspire them to be better instructional leaders, to be better managers, you know, in their building. And so um, there are some compliance issues, some directives you know, as it relates to policy that they have to adhere to. But I also believe, like I said earlier, that, uh, you know, having some flexibility there is critical. So let me ask you this. Do the principals you work with, <coughs> excuse me, are they comfortable with the idea of instructional leadership or are they still in the building management um, mindset, which, which has dominated the profession for so long? You know, I think a little bit of both. You know, and, I, and one of the things that I, you know, because I had such intense, incredible uh, preparation, you know, at, with the St. Paul Public School System through uh, Pat Harvey and Maria Land, that um, uh, it, it's something that I bring to the table in, in Boulder. Uh, you know, they're high-achieving schools that I work with, but that's not good enough for me. I want all of our kids to, to either meet or exceed the standard. And so that means principals really – having uh, an intimate relationship with their groups, whether they're subgroups or, or groups, uh, special education kids, English language kids, or students that are just behind. You know, they need to know those kids. They need to be able to motivate those teachers and give the teachers the skills, the strategies, and the professional development to differentiate the, the instruction to teach those kids. And so um, my job, like I said, is to... Uh, to, to bring what, what I learned as a principal through the Institute for Learning, through, you know, all of the, the, the readers and writers workshop models, trainings that I had to go through, the principal's think tank, you know, being at Harvard, you know, for a couple of weeks. You know, I bring all of these skills to the table. But I also bring the skills, you know, that I um, uh, had when I, I played, you know, sports. You know, those are critical pieces to, to, to my uh, repertoire that, that I bring to the table uh, to help me motivate and inspire the principals that I work with so that they can be true instructional leaders. And so one of the things that I do is I just don't have meetings at the district office. We go to a school where I, I talk to these principals and I know what their strengths are, so I'll, I'll go to a, a school to where I know a, a principal has a certain strength in an area. It could be how, how do you facilitate a meeting. How do you co-facilitate a meeting with, with a teacher? And we'll go to that school and we'll, you know, have our few minutes that we talk about, um, you know, whatever's on the agenda, and then that principal goes into action. And so those principals, the ones that I work with, have an opportunity to see one of their colleagues, you know, perform at an exemplar, you know, the type of skill, skill level. You know, and once we once they leave, you know, those are the, that's the expectation that I expect them to perform at. So you know, what you're really you know. talking about is kind of unlocking expertise that exists within a building. And Absolutely. that's what I saw you do at Dayton's Bluff as a principal. You were very deliberate about unlocking the expertise that was in classrooms so that if a teacher was excellent at running a morning meeting, you would have that teacher – talk with the other teachers about that. Am I right? Absolutely. That was a part of our ongoing professional development. And we did monthly uh, walks through the building to see if teachers were actually doing uh, the professional development that we taught the previous month. You know, we were very, very, you know, just strict. And, um, you know, this was an exemplar. We had model classrooms where if we had a struggling teacher um, we gave them an opportunity to watch a master teacher. And so, you know, when it came time, you know, to, to evaluate, um, you know, they had an opportunity to see uh, what an exemplar looked like. And so there were no excuses. 
Yeah, so Vaughn, it's been great hearing you talk about um, your own leadership and you, you can definitely see the parallels with how you're trying to bring um, what, both what you experienced and what you created in your school to the district level. Uh, right now, for the audience, we have a slide up about what effective principals do. Uh, the Wallace Foundation has been leading research for about 10 years to really better understand leadership and the principalship uh, in particular, and I think the, the main points of what effective principals do are very much what you talked about and things that you learned both through on-the-job training as well as through some of your experiences that the district provided um, and school opportunities that, that you had. Um, and I think there's consensus growing out there in the field right now about just how important principals are. Um, but I think that we've left a lot of things to chance and haven't really thought about developing the principal pipeline more generally so all of our schools have effective principals. It sounds like you're doing that on a, on a daily basis um, in Boulder, but there's also new research about, just, about the roles that districts can play and the levers that they have at their disposal to really improve the pipeline. Uh, one of the things is clearly defining standards for principals, which is something that um, it sounds like your district has created and, and done already. Um, some of the others are, are actions that the district can take to support principals, uh, whether it be through uh, providing data or providing time for principals to focus on instruction. Can you talk a little bit about some of the other steps that your district is taking to create that pipeline? Um, from, I guess the first question is really um, regarding recruitment. You, you've been talking a lot about how you support and develop the principals that you are currently working with. Does your district or have you thought about who you recruit into the principalship? So yeah, how you I mean, identify candidates that would be good for your schools? Well, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, our district really promotes is, is diversity. And when we go into the, the recruiting phase and we interview uh, principals, um, you know, those are certain questions that we ask and we look for certain, certain answers. Uh, you know, and, and we can tell uh, by how deep they go whether or not they really promote diversity, and, and that's critical. You know, we have some issues as it relates to our Latino students in our district uh, not doing so well. And so we're really looking to, to, to close the achievement gap, and principals have to be able to talk about how they're going to, uh, to, to really motivate and inspire their teachers to teach all kids. And when I say all, I mean all. And, and so, uh, you know, there, there are certain criteria that we look for. You know, when we recruit, we also... Um, we also engage the, the teachers and the parents in the conversation. It's just not about the district. I go out to, to that school. We have parent nights and we have uh, teachers uh, nights to where they weigh in on the characteristics that they want in the principal. And one of the things that comes up almost every time from teachers when I'm about to hire a, a principal and a characteristic that they're looking for, they say, Mr. Shepard, we want somebody that can motivate us. We want somebody that can inspire us. And what they're saying is we want an instructional leader. We want somebody that's going to be able to give us some meaningful feedback. And so when we look for principals, when we recruit them, we look for those characteristics. You know, you have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to have a vision. You have to be able to um, create an environment that's conducive for learning. And that means being able to deal with discipline and being able to confront, being able to have those courageous conversations. You know, about instruction, about a discipline. And so, you know, there are certain characteristics that we look for, and uh, we don't back off of them. It's a very, very strenuous process that uh, principals have to go through in order to be a principal in uh, Boulder. It, it sounds like some of the things that you're looking for align directly with those standards that your district has developed, diversity being one of them, communication, instructional leadership. So it sounds like those are the guiding principles for how you interview and, and recruit candidates. Do you also look and, and look and grow candidates from within your district and provide them opportunities for additional training and credentials for the principalship? Absolutely. I mean, if you can't grow within, I mean, it's going to be hard for you to, to, to really attract, you know, those teachers that may be aspiring to be principals. And so, you know, that's definitely something that we look at. And, you know, when we're in schools, we talk to principals um, to see, you know, who their superstars are. 
and we give them an opportunity, you know, when an opening comes up or when there's an interim uh, to, to, to slide in, you know, to see how they'll do. You know, but I think that's a critical piece to, to, to really growing your own within is to give them some opportunities but also give them the professional developments and to learn from the principles that are in their building. Yeah, I think one of the other um, main issues within um, the principal pipeline is the leadership preparation programs. Uh, we know mm -hmm. that there are myriad, myriads of programs out there of varying quality, uh, and more often than not, the research shows that the principal preparation programs aren't preparing the types of principals we need now. They had a method of preparing principals that focused a lot on theory but less on the, the practical um, realities of being a principal who needs to improve instruction and focus on instructional leadership. Um, you know, you're in a, a community that has, has a university. Uh, have you been able to develop a relationship with any of the universities or colleges in the area to develop the principles and the skills that you need in Boulder? You know, we have a relationship with the uh, University of Colorado in Boulder, but as far as, um, you know, a relationship as it relates to training principals, we're not there yet. We're in conversations with professors at the school, and so uh, I think that's to come. But it's something that we did in St. Paul. Uh, we worked with the University of Minnesota. We worked with the University of Pittsburgh. And like I said, it, it definitely helped prepare me to be the instructional leader to be the manager, um, you know, within the building um, that I was principal at. Uh, I, I can't say enough about the uh, Institute for Learning out of the University of Pittsburgh. Like I said, Donna Michelle, I learned from her. She was a mentor, was one of the best instructional leaders that I've ever seen. And so, uh, you know, I can't say enough about what they did to train me as a principal. What kinds of things would you ask the university to do, or are you asking them to do that would help prepare principals for Boulder. You had mentioned that your district is fairly high performing, but the issue is really um, achievement gaps. Yeah, you know, we've been in uh, conversations with, like I said, the professors, and we're, we're looking at some of the things that uh, the Denver Public Schools, you know, has done as it relates to their training programs and working with the University of Colorado, University of Denver, you know, in Colorado. But um, as it relates to just the specifics, you know, we're still in the discussion stages, I'll be honest. It's very early, you know, in our process as to what we're doing as it relates to principal training. Although you may think that you're very in the very early phases, I think that most districts aren't even having those conversations yet, so I think that um, you're definitely tackling um, the different aspects of the principal pipeline that uh, the Wallace Foundation has, has really identified. I think the, you know, we talked a lot about the support and development that you try and provide and how you work with mentors for your new principals. I think the last piece of that pipeline is the evaluation system. And I think I heard you mention that you do have an evaluation system uh, in Boulder. Could you talk a little bit about that and, and how it aligns with your principal standards and how you use that to support the principals? Well, the the, the standards that I quoted is a part of the evaluation system. And so, you know, at the beginning of the year, uh, when I talk to the principals about their goals, it's around communication, it's around instructional leadership, it's around management, managing the resources, it's about empowering teachers. You know, it's about promoting diversity. And so, you know, the, those, those are the standards that we have. In, in Colorado, uh, as we speak, uh, they have uh, passed Senate Bill 191, where they're going to, we're, we're going to be looking at uh, student performance as a part of the evaluation system for not only principals but teachers as well. And so we're looking at how can we tweak that to to work with with the standards that uh, Boulder has. They're allowing uh, the CDE, uh, California Department of Education, is allowing us to tweak that a little bit. So we're working with a with a group of people to develop a, a memorandum of understanding with. Um, with our district and our principals to, to really figure out how we're going to um, make that happen. Uh, it's, it's a huge step. I think Colorado is at the forefront in leading in, um, you know, doing some, some different things as it relates to the evaluation system, and uh, we're, we're taking those steps. Um, so I noticed it's a 
about quarter of five, and we want to invite our audience to submit questions as well. I think we've covered um, a lot of the characteristics of an effective principal as well as some of the levers that districts have um, to improve the principal pipeline. And Karen and I can, of course, continue to ask questions, but we welcome your questions, so please type those into the chat box, and we will um, ask them aloud to Vaughn. One of, the th one of the points we wanted to make was that the, the Wallace Foundation has, is working with Denver, as a matter of fact. It, it's, uh, the Wallace Foundation now is working with six districts around the country, and they're really trying to put together this principal pipeline. So, uh, you know, you're behind Denver. You know, Boulder is behind Denver, but uh, Denver is one of the leading districts in the, um, in the country in developing both le leader standards, working with the university to create high quality aspiring leader pro programs, hiring carefully and evaluation and on the job support. It sounds like Boulder has a lot of the pieces together, but not quite, is not quite there in terms of the, 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 that training, that relationship with the university around the training programs. Is that? You know, you're absolutely, you're absolutely yeah. right. And when I was in St. Paul, um, Denver Public Schools was a part of the Leadership Institute out of the University of Pittsburgh, and they, uh, they sent uh, two or three principals to be a part of that process. And so, you know, they understand, you know, uh, the learning walks, uh, you know, they, they've been there. And so they were kind of early in with uh, the St. Paul Public Schools, and that was early 2001, 2002. And so they've been doing this a long time. And, uh, you know, if there's anybody for us to look at, um, and, and model some things after, it would be uh, DPS. Yeah, I think you're talking about, you know, we're talking about sort of the levers that the district has, has but uh, the research that the Wallace Foundation has, has done has really identified states having a role as well. Um, it sounds like you're building some of those collaborations yourself with other district, other like-minded districts to help move the process along. Absolutely. To learn from them, just like you sort of do with your principals. Absolutely. You know, what? It, it occurs to me that one of the things we haven't talked about but is kind of core to, to what I know about you is why we're doing all this. Like, what's the point? And you talk about this in a really um, impassioned way. And, you know, up until now we've been so professional, right? <laughs> it's all about the professional standards and evaluation and, and learning walks and instructional leadership, but like, what's the point? Can you like, why did you want to do this? This is tough work. You, uh, I, I might as well just say it. When I got to Dayton's Bluff, you were tired. <laughs> you were you, know you were tired. I mean, you needed a little break before you could plunge back into into this work. But you have plunged back into it. Why? You know, at the end of the day, it's about the kids. It's about the kids, Karen and Christine. But that's why I'm in this work. You know, we we have a responsibility as leaders. You know, when I think about teachers and the work that they do, you know, we should put them on a pedestal in every state, in every city. You know, these teachers are a part of developing the minds of the Oprah Winfrey's, the Barack Obamas, the Hillary Clintons. You know, the, the, the Aristotles, the Invotes. I mean, these are the people that are part of developing the minds of the people that we look up to today. They touch everyone. And so, you know, the, the, the leaders that we have today once were kids. And if we don't tap into these kids, it's not what we do for these kids. It's what we put in them that's important. And so for me, my, my passion is about making sure that I touch people who are going to touch kids because they're our future. You know, and I tell teachers all the time, I mean, you know, our kids are so advanced as it relates to technology, and you have to engage them. And if you don't, you know, keep up with, with, with technology and education where it is right now, you're going to be left behind. You know, we have to develop these kids. We have to create a belief system that at the end of the day, that we are confident enough and enthusiastic enough that these kids can go from one grade level to the next, graduate from middle school, elementary, middle school, graduate from high school, 
and evidently graduate from college so that they can communicate and negotiate and compete against anybody on this planet. It's a very, very competitive world, and so my job is to make sure that I instill in these kids that they can. Yes, they can. Do it. Yes, they can be anybody that they want to be. And it is our responsibility to help them get there. Because I know you know somebody in your life, a teacher in your life, and you can probably name her. I can name her. Miss Brewer, when I was a uh, at, at Sand Creek Elementary and Miss West at Central High School. We know these teachers that have taken us to another level and have provided us with the guidance and the help and the, and the care. I told my teachers, these students, if, if they know that you care, they will reach any expectation that you have for them. And so for us, it, it, for me, it's about the kids. And I, know I wanted I'm to get them. that in because... You could miss that with all our conversation about standards and, and principal pipelines and so forth, but it's about the kids and building on that. Starting from that, we then get to, you know, every all the pieces of work that you've been talking about. And Vaughn, I, Karen, I've had this conversation with you before and just hearing your passion um, for, the, for the work um, and how much you enjoyed being a principal and being directly involved. How is the transition for you going from leading your own school to supervising other principals when you maybe don't have that same direct contact uh, with the students? You know, I'll be honest, it's been very, very difficult. I miss the kids. That's why I try and get into the building as much as I can. And on any given day, you'll see me in a, in a building, in, in a school, and I'll be on the floor with the kids doing work. You know, that's how much passion I have for this work and making sure that I have a connection, you know, with all of the kids. And, you know, it's, it's been a very, very difficult transition. I've all, I almost thought about going back to the principalship because I miss it so much. Well, um, it, it sounds like you bring that passion to this job, though, and work to use that to motivate the principals that, that you do work with. You know, I do. I, I do. You know, what I do as a assistant superintendent is nothing different than what I did as a principal. And it should be nothing different than what teachers do with their kids. You know, if you show people that you work with that you truly care and believe in them, they will meet, they will reach any expectation that you have in them. I, I truly believe that. I've seen it happen. Yeah, so it's interesting. So you went from, can you hear hello? us, Vaughn? Oh, yeah, hello. So it sounds like you went from being a, a teacher of teachers when you were principal, and now you're a teacher of principals um, in terms of Im improving the system. Absolutely. Absolutely, the, the, the same skills and strategies apply because what I do with my principals is what I did with my my, uh, my teachers. You know, it, this work is about developing relationships with people. 75% of it is developing that relationship, intimate relationships, so that they can hear you, so that they can hear your coaching, so that they can hear your guidance, so that they can hear when you push them and they not get offended. You know, it has to be done in a tactful way. But I pushed the principals that I work with. When I was a principal, I pushed the teachers. You know, uh, yeah. they knew that I cared about them. They knew that I wanted them to be their best. Yeah, I think that's where we started the conversation. You were talking about the importance of relationships to get this work done. This is really hard work. Um, and being an effective principal takes a lot of work and um, maintaining that focus um, on academic success for all students, the, the research really shows is primary, that belief and vision in students um, is what guides this work, and you're very impassionate talking about that, and you keep that at the core of what you're doing um, in training principles. And it was really great to hear you talk about how you've transitioned that into a district leadership role. Um, hopefully that will inspire others who have those same strong beliefs in terms of thinking that they can take that to a higher level so we can ensure that more schools have highly successful principals running them, highly effective principals running them. Um, and it's also really great to hear Boulder's story and your story in Boulder, that you're working on many of those pieces of the pipeline that we as a country know we need to fix to really ensure we have um, effective principals 
uh, for all of our students and those principals who can focus on closing the achievement gap that uh, you talked about really working on in your district. Thank you. So, so it's always really interesting to see how research intersects with real life experiences. And what we know from our work, as well as from other research out there, is that school principals matter a great deal. And um, uh, they matter to the lives of children, particularly poor children and children of color who aren't always very well served by their schools. And principals who believe that all children can achieve and who work hard to master the knowledge and skill necessary to run schools to help them can have an outsized effect in helping short circuit the effects of poverty and discrimination. And I think that's, that's what we heard from you. Um, you highlighted this idea, and this has been just an amazing conversation, as all our conversations always have been. And I, I want to alert folks to the fact that you'll have an article in an upcoming issue of the Kappen magazine about your experiences at Dayton's Bluff. Uh, which month will that be? I will be in the May issue, Karen. Oh, the May issue. Okay. So, so, because um, we really weren't able to talk as much about Dayton's Bluff as, as I know you and I uh, and Christina would have liked. So, anybody who is hungry for more information about Dayton's Bluff can can get it from uh, from that article in May. Um, and as you know, uh, I'm hoping this is the opening shot for a book that you're going to write, right? Absolutely. I'm writing it as we <laughs> Excellent. Yep. That's great. That's that's wonderful. Um, and I hope everyone listening will register for the rest of the webinars in this series. Uh, we will talk to some other great school leaders who are now in new roles helping and supporting principals. Uh, next month we'll be talking with Jeffrey Litt, who is superintendent of one of the top performing charter school networks in New York City, the Icon, Icon Charter School Network. Uh, for many years, he was principal in the Bronx and was widely known for his transformation of Mohegan School, uh, in large part by focusing closely on curriculum instruction. Uh, he has brought that focus along with the core knowledge curriculum to ICON, and we'll be talking with him about his experience as a school leader and how that informs his current role as superintendent. Um, and as always, we'll connect up with the best research on school leadership. Yeah, so to anyone interested in registering for that, I. I don't know that there's a link, but if you go to edtrust.org, uh, it's right on the home page there, and you can uh, uh, register there. And if you found this webinar interesting, or even if you haven't, uh, Christina and I hope you will uh, read our book, Getting It Done, where, uh, which draws lessons from a wide range of leaders, uh, 33 principals and assistant principals, including Vaughn and tries to really distill, uh, distill the knowledge that they all uh, shared with us. And we want to urge you to attend uh, the EdTrust conference um, at the end of October in Baltimore. The EdTrust is, conference is a unique opportunity to connect with advocates, educators, policymakers, and researchers uh, to really share what is really working for students around the country. Vaughn, you were, you were a speaker this past year. Uh, I, ho I hope you enjoyed that experience. I hope you've, you, you bring back some of your principles next year. Absolutely. I definitely will. And I just want to say this, Karen, and to you too, Christine, the work that both of you are doing, you know, in our schools and showing, you know, the, the country, the world, that it can be done. You know, there are no excuses when it comes to educating our kids because, some people are finding the way, and we have to be able to, to feed off of that. And, and, and you, too, are providing the research and the schools where, where people can go to see that it is being done. So I just want you to know I appreciate the work that both of you are doing in, in, in the world of education. Well, thank you. You're the one doing the work. We're just yakking about it, really. <laughs> <laughs> So right. thank you so much. Thank you, Vaughn, very much. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, we will see you March 12th for our next webinar. And thanks again.